18 and verse 3. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And our subject this morning is one essential or vital trait of character without which we can never enter heaven itself. And of course, if we belong to the kingdom of heaven, the phrase that the Lord Jesus Christ uses here, it will mean that our souls at death will enter heaven itself. We belong to the kingdom here on earth, but our abode at death will be with God in heaven. And when Christ used this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, he is referring to something more, of course, than heaven itself. It is something we may enter now. What does it mean then? Or what did Christ mean by this phrase or this title, the kingdom of heaven? It means to come under the reign of God or the reign of Christ, to come under his royal rule, to experience and entrust ourselves to his care, to his protection, to look to him for provision, for guidance. To enter the kingdom of heaven is to gain a new citizenship with all the entitlements of those that belong to the kingdom. And if you read through the Gospels, you will see the Lord Jesus Christ regularly refers to the children of the kingdom, those who are heirs of its blessings, entitled to its privileges, who can look to its promises for encouragement. It is those who belong, who have entered the kingdom of heaven, who will be justified from all their sin and guilt. They have access to the Father. They are subjects of his sanctifying work. He makes them holy in this life that they may be prepared for heaven in the next. And of course, if we enter the kingdom of heaven, we are no longer citizens of this fallen world system. We may be part of the world, we may belong to the nation in a physical sense, and yet at the same time we are not part of its sinful culture. We no longer are loyal to its Christ-rejecting, God-hating system of thinking and living. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Colossians, wrote this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now in these verses, the Lord is speaking about an essential trait of character that all must have if they are to enter in to this kingdom and be a partaker of its privileges. But before we do look at that, then I want to ask you to consider afresh the privileges that are implied in the description of this kingdom. Because this is the great divide in human society. We hear a lot in recent days about divisions of race, divisions in society between rich and poor. But ultimately, as the Lord God looks down upon this world, there are the haves and the have-nots. Those that have entered into the kingdom and those that have not entered into the kingdom. That is the great divide in our congregation this morning. Those who belong to the kingdom of heaven and those who are still part of this fallen, ungodly system in this world. Which do you belong to? Are you under the care and the blessing of God? Have you yielded 
to the rule and the reign and the teaching of Christ? Or do you reject these things? You are amongst the have-nots. But if you have come to Christ and yielded to him and sought his blessing upon your life and sought entrance into his kingdom, then how privileged you and I are. And yet here in this verse, the disciples are warned that they are in danger of missing out. And we too are to learn from these birds a vital trait of character without which we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the language is strong. Notice the beginning of verse 3. The Lord says, Verily I say unto you. That is the word in the original which is literally Amen. It means certainly I say unto you. Assuredly I say unto you. Some translate it, I solemnly declare unto you. This is the Lord's way of drawing attention to the weight and the significance of what he is about to state. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now in English, we only have one word for not. But in Greek, there were two words for not. And when you put them together, it became a double negative. And when we say a double negative in English, it means a positive, but not in Greek. It meant a most strong negative. And it's masked from our English translation, but here, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, you shall not enter, it's like a double yellow line. It is an absolute. You cannot, you shall not. It is impossible. There is great emphasis here. Verily, I say unto you, I solemnly say, you will not, that strong not, enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so when we see this strong language, we must prick up our ears. We must focus our attention. We must consider what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ is alerting us to. But before we look at that, what does this word enter imply? You cannot or you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Enter so as to belong. Now it's not like we enter into the kingdom of heaven as we enter into a city or we enter into a house. This is a spiritual kingdom. But the Lord uses the word enter here because there is a sense in which we do enter. We have to leave an old life behind. We have to enter through the door such that we now belong to that kingdom. And then we can think of this word, it implies a conscious experience. Having entered, we experience the care of God, the conscious sense that we belong to the Lord, that we are an object of his care and of his love. And every person who has come to the Lord and has entered into his kingdom, will be able to say that they are now conscious that they are a child of God. It's a great blessing. We may not initially know that assurance of salvation, but it's a blessing which the Lord has promised to all his children, that we consciously realize that we now have passed from death unto life, We've passed from the darkness of this world into the, <coughs> the glorious light of his heavenly realm. We enter by faith, by believing. Look at verse 6 here. The Lord speaks of one of these little ones, those with a childlike spirit, which believe in me. That's a parallel phrase, really, to entering into 
the kingdom. It's as we believe the word of God. It's as we believe the invitation of Christ and his promise to receive us. It's as we believe in him as the all-sufficient saviour who laid down his life to pay the penalty for our sin. It's as we cast ourselves upon him believing that he is the only saviour, trusting our souls to him, it's in that way that we enter. But we must come back to this word, except, in verse 3. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. No wonder the language here used by Christ is strong. Notice that It was at the same time that, verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The context here is such that we have to marvel at the tenderness and the long-suffering character and the merciful nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the previous chapter, verse 23, we are told how he was explaining to his disciples that he must go up to Jerusalem and that he would suffer and be killed and they were exceeding sorrowful. And then, almost immediately, we find that they are bickering and vying over who is to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord could have lost his cool, understandably, with the disciples at this point. He could have reproached them very severely, but he simply takes a child and stands the child in the midst of them and then utters these words. And they're strong, understandably so, because the disciples needed a warning and a rebuke, and perhaps we do too. What is it then that the Lord draws attention to? And there are three things, but in a sense, they all make up one trait. They all refer or focus upon one essential character trait or mark without which none shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So three things here. You need to be converted, he says. Then he says, you need to become as little children. And then at the beginning of verse 4, he says there is the need that a person humble themselves as a little child. So I want to look at these three phrases very briefly, and then we must apply these things to ourselves most precisely. To be converted. The word used here literally means to be turned around. It's not the same word that is used elsewhere, often translated conversion or repentance, but it means something very similar. The Lord here is saying to his disciples, you need to be turned around in your thinking. And of course, we speak of conversion as being the turning around of our whole life and character, a change wrought within our souls by the power of God through his spirit so that we have a changed attitude to him, a changed attitude to ourselves, to our sin, to eternal things, changed priorities, changed desires. We begin to love things that once we despised and hate things that are wrong and sinful that once we cleaved to. This is conversion in its broadest sense. But the Lord here is especially drawing attention to one thing in which we need to be turned or turned from. And that is from our pride and from our worldly ambition and selfishness. That's what would come to the fore in the words and in the attitude of the disciples at this point. They were vying over who was to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And they came to the Lord, asking him. And he knew their thoughts perfectly. And so he says, you need to be turned away from that. 
You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven whilst you have such a spirit where you want to be the greatest, where in your pride you want to be exalted above others. That's no way to enter the kingdom. It will bar you. It will keep you out of the kingdom. And then he adds, and remember these are three phrases, but as we shall see, they are all pointing to the same particular trait of character. He adds, who shall, uh, you must become, sorry, as little children. Now, a childlike disposition implies many things. But above all here, it is a reference to a humble, teachable, trusting disposition. We know that firstly from verse 4, where he says, Whosoever therefore, is continuation of verse 3, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 6, he says, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me. So it's a humble and yet believing, trusting disposition that the Lord has in mind here. Now, children generally, I know there are some that are precocious and some that even at an early age can be quite proud, but generally children recognize, particularly little children, they recognize their lack of knowledge and they look to adults to fill in the details, to explain things to them. And they trust uh, the explanations that they are given by grown-ups and by adults. That's part of their humble disposition. They acknowledge, well, I don't know. I need to look to mum or to dad or to those who are older than me to show me how to do this, what to do. And then generally, children recognize that they are weak that they are dependent, that they are not independent, that they are uh, in need of the care and the protection of their parents, and they need others to support them and defend them. And children generally, particularly little children, they know that they are unimportant. Now, of course, we have to qualify that because even the most the youngest child is important to its parents. And every child of God is important to the Lord. But there is a sense in which we know that when it comes to authority, when it comes to status, we are unimportant in that sense. And that's what the Lord is speaking about here. If we would enter into the kingdom, then we must have this humble trusting disposition of a child. And so he says, and this is the third phrase we need to notice at the beginning of verse 4, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Without it, you will not even get into the kingdom. But those who are the most humble, who have the greatest sense of their own insufficiency and their own need of the teaching of the Lord, their own sense of how in, unimportant they are in comparison to others, they are those, says the Lord, who are greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the trait of character that the Lord is drawing attention to here is humility. True, godly humility. It's vital. It's vital as we enter. It's vital as we continue as members of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pride has barred many from the kingdom of heaven. Pride will be the reason why many are banished eternally to hell. Pride was the barrier 
that prevented their entry. And so I want us to stop this moment, at this point and ask the question, are we outside of the kingdom for this reason? Our pride. What is the opposite of childlike humility? Well, it's proud audacity so often. And we need to begin by thinking of the proud audacity of this world. In Psalm 10 and verse 4 we read, The wicked, through pride, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. And perhaps some of us, we're tuned in this morning, but we're outside the kingdom because we've followed this world in its pride, in its audacity to reject and dismiss the teaching of God. In Psalm 2 and verse 2, we read, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And that's the cause. That's the reason why many are outside the kingdom of God. In their pride, they say, we cannot accept the claims of God, the authority of God, the teaching of God through his word. We're going to make our own minds up. We're going to forge our own path in life. Rather like Pharaoh, when Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and said, let, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. What was Pharaoh's response? He said, Who is the Lord? And that I should obey his voice. And perhaps some of us this morning, in our pride, deep down, that's our response to the claims of the Lord through his word as it is preached. Well, who is the Lord? that I should take notice of him, that I should fear his name, that I should respect his claims upon my life. The world dismiss Christianity. They say Christianity is a crutch for the weak. But we are not weak. We are strong. We are able to fend for ourselves, to make our own way in life. We do not need God. And it's an expression of pride. And for some, it is the pride of atheistic humanism. That's the spirit of our particular society. No recognition of God. Humanism. Men are champions. Men can work things out for themselves. Human society, the human race needs no longer consider the importance of God. In some cultures, in some parts of the world, it's a sort of national patriotism that expresses itself in pride. And it says, we do not follow the religion of the Bible. It's not our religion. We have our own way of thinking. We have our own gods. We have our own culture. And in pride... The teaching of the word of God is rejected. But you know, pride expresses itself differently at different stages in life. And so I want to think this morning about three ways in which pride expresses itself at different stages in our lives. Some of us tuned in this morning, we're young. We're children. Perhaps we're in our teens Others of us are in middle life. Some of us are elderly, although perhaps we do not like to think of ourselves in that way. But when we are in our youth, there is that rebellious spirit of youth. But behind it is pride. And it's that pride that the Lord warns us against here. It must be rejected. It must be abandoned. In our teenage years, we begin to assert our independence from our parents. But often that also leads to an assertion of our independence in our thinking and in our attitude to God. We have a growing confidence in my opinions, in my way of 
living my life. And increasingly, through teenage years and this proud, audacious world, encourages and fans the flames of this rebellion, increasingly we are willing to question and dismiss and argue with what is taught by the word of God, by the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn to suppress the voice of conscience. In our childhood, we were sensitive and tender and we feared to sin, but we In our pride, we learn the art of suppressing our conscience's voice. We are not going to be told, either by the Bible as it is preached, or by the voice of God within in our conscience. We turn a deaf ear. And often, it's the case that young people, they follow this rebellious, proud, independent way of thinking as a result of their friends and their friendship. Sometimes it's but one friend. I remember J.C. Ryle warned the young people of his day, Satan only wishes that you have one ungodly friend, one who will lead you astray, one who will shape your thinking, who will strengthen your defiance against God, who will fuel your proud rejection of his ways. Those of you who saw the adult Bible class this week concerning Adoniram Judson will see that it was just one friend who had such an impact upon him as a young man, an ungodly atheist of a friend who led him far from the Lord. Of course, in his mercy, the Lord brought him back. But initially, that one friend fueled his pride and he defied all that he had learned of God in the scriptures in his early years. Pride is expressed so often in the rebellious thinking of our youth. And we need to be aware of that because the Lord says here, except you be converted, turned from that pride, turned from that spirit and become as little children, then you shall not enter in to the kingdom of heaven. Then there is the cold stubbornness of old age. That's a form of pride. And it's quite tragic for preachers often to see that those who are, by the law of statistics, nearest to their end, who in cold stubbornness refuse the invitations of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's their stubbornness is often strengthened by their self-righteousness, their sense that they are of good character. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't many who are elderly, who are, by the measure of this world, people of good character. They've lived respectable lives. They are generally caring and sympathetic and honest and principled. But they overlook the fact that they are still sinners, that God's laws still condemn them because God's laws are perfect and just. And often the blind spot in the thinking of many elderly people who have not entered the kingdom of Christ The blind spot is they do not see that they have lived for years without any acknowledgement of God. They've not yielded to him. They've not worshipped him. They've not shown any love and reverence for him. And though they may have lived decently before fellow people around them, they have had no time for God and the things of God. And conscience has been silenced for so long that they hardly hear it and they are unwilling to admit that they fall far short of the glory of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy strength and with all thy soul. Young, uh, old, old people this morning, as you listen to the word of God, can you say that you have done that? 
that you've loved the Lord with all your strength. That's the standard that the Lord as our creator requires. And so often when we grow old and the message of the gospel says you need to acknowledge your sin, you need to recognize before the Lord that your life has been lived selfishly and self-centeredly in cold stubbornness. We say, no, I cannot accept that. I cannot acknowledge that before God, I am guilty and hell deserving and worthy of his wrath. Pride gets in the way, you see, because genuine repentance and faith bring us to that point where we humble ourselves before the Lord and acknowledge that we are unworthy of his mercy. And then there is the settled assurance. I've called it the settled assurance of middle life. Those who are in their middle years, they've left the youth behind them. Uh, they would not wish to be categorized amongst the elderly. But they've learned to suppress conscience. Their achievements have masked, masked their deepest needs. Death to them seems so distant. And the things of God and the warnings and the invitations of the word of God for them are irrelevant. In their pride, they are more interested in worldly advance and success here on earth and being admired and acclaimed by those around them. And if you say to such, but you need to humble yourself as a little child, and you need to accept God's word and all that it teaches. They refuse these things. And yet that is the message here to us all, whether we are tempted by the rebellious spirit of youth or whether we are entrenched in that cold stubbornness of old age or whether in the middle of life we are uh, too focused upon the here and now and in our pride, we say, I don't need God or the things of God. This verse tells us, except ye become as little children, ye shall not in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean then to humble ourselves as little children? Firstly, it means that we are willing to bow to the authority of God's word and that's hard for many we follow we are swept along shaped by this proud world and to accept what God's word teaches in everything is too much we see it so often people who say well I want to become a Christian but I can't accept that God created the world in six days but really, the alternative, theistic evolution as it's known, is an expression of scientific pride. Man, in his pride, says, well, the word of God says this, but I've got to make it fit into my scientific paradigm. It's got to fit what I believe to be true from observation. No, if we would enter the kingdom then we have to humble ourselves and we have to say, let God be true. Let every man be a liar. I will not set myself up as an arbiter of God's word. I will take it as it is revealed, as it speaks to me. And I will understand it and accept all that it declares. And it is the same with what the Bible declares with regard to biblical morality. So many today will say, well, I can't accept the Bible because it flies in the face of modern ideas of morality. The Bible says that marriage is between one woman and one man for life. But our modern view of what's decent is so at variance with that. No, we fall before God's word. We yield to his standards. The word of God calls for us to obey in every detail. And if we would enter the kingdom, then we must humble ourselves 
We must come in a childlike way, believing God's word to be true, his commandments to be good, his standards to be right, his explanation of life to be accurate. As soon as we begin to question these things, pride is in the way, and it's a great barrier to our entrance into the kingdom of God. Humbling ourselves as a little child, secondly, it means to yield to God's way, not my way. God's way, not my way. I'm going to live, says the humble person, as God directs, for his glory, not for my advantage and honour. And that was something the disciples needed to learn here. They had such a blinkered view of the kingdom. They had this illusion that Christ would be an earthly monarch, that he would establish Israel as a great nation, and they would be his generals. They would be those prominent members of his government. But they had to learn that his kingdom was not of this world, and that everything would not be for their own advantage, but for his glory. And they had to be turned from this, Except you be converted, he said. Turn from this way of thinking. Well, how can I cry, climb up the ladder of importance? No, we enter as little children. And we do not seek to make a name for ourselves, but rather we live as servants of Jesus Christ. And then to humble ourselves, it means that we are willing to concede that Jesus Christ is alone our merit before God. I'm running out of time, and I'll have to be brief here. But so many, when they hear the gospel that says that Christ is the way to heaven, Christ is the way into the kingdom, they say, yes, but what about my, me? I've been a good person. I've done this. I've done that. I've not done this. I've not done that. Surely before God, that counts for something. No, the way into the kingdom is when we recognize that Christ alone, all his obedience in life, the righteous life that he lived, that's the only merit that we can plead before, for acceptance before God. The death of Christ most necessary. That's an offence, says the apostle. The, the preaching of the cross is an offence to many people. What did he mean? It's a stumbling block. You see, the cross of Christ, when it is preached, declared that the only way a lost soul, a sinner, a person can be accepted with God is when they renounce everything about themselves. And they come before God and say, I've got nothing to commend me, nothing to recommend me. I'm hell-deserving, I'm a bankrupt, diseased sinner. But I look to Christ. His cross was the triumph of, 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 the, of God over sin. It was at Calvary that Jesus Christ bore away the guilt of all that should trust in him, there upon Calvary, he accomplished everything that was necessary to secure my acceptance and my access before God. And I trust in that alone. Pride says I can't accept that I'm a sinner. Pride cannot accept that there's nothing about me that makes me worthy of God's receiving me. We have to humble ourselves as a little child and say, O oh Lord, I am unworthy. I am insignificant. I enter the kingdom confessing that my every plea is Jesus Christ alone. And lastly, let's just look briefly at verses 4 to 6. Because here in verse 5, the Lord says, Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name 
receiveth me. There's something here about the spirit of humility that must mark the kingdom of God, that must mark the way the church, the people of God, interact with one another. Humility receives others as equals. The implication here is that we may look down upon those who are only children. But those who are children in a spiritual sense, who have a humble, childlike, non-assertive spirit, who are content to acknowledge that they are the lowest, the meanest, the most uneducated, the most lacking in grace and knowledge, but they plead Christ alone for acceptance. It is these, says the Lord, who we receive. And when we receive them, because they have that humble, trusting, childlike spirit, we, re we are receiving him. There is amongst the Lord's people in the kingdom of heaven no class difference, no partiality. When we are converted, when our minds are turned, then they are turned from all that high-mindedness, all that prejudice, and all that self-centeredness. That was what was displaying itself here in the attitude of the disciples. And the Lord said, you come into the kingdom as a little child, and then you receive one another as little children. Let's close just by looking at verse 3 once again. Notice here the phrase, except you be converted. The implication here is this is something that God must do. He must churn you. He must change you. And this morning, let us close by recognizing this fact. Oh Lord, left to myself, I would so easily uh, embrace that spirit of pride. In my youth, in rebelliousness, in old age, in stubborn coldness and indifference to those tender invitations to come to Christ for forgiveness. Lord, I need to be converted. I need my whole life to be turned and particularly my thinking to be turned such that I am moved to be humble. Lord, work the spirit within me that I may not seek to enter the kingdom with my pride, with a sense of my own importance, but willing to be the lowest and the meanest member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. Amen. We conclude by singing together 374.